Thank you. Welcome to this panel. Uh, today we have the truck congestion and ports a crisis with interrelated solutions. Thank you very much to our sponsor today, Red Hook, Ter uh, Red Hook Terminals. Um, just a reminder that this session does qualify for AIA and ASLA CEUs, um, and that's on the sign-in sheet where uh, you picked up your badge. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to our moderator for today, uh, Mike Somatis, the president and CEO of Red Hook Terminals. Thank you for being here and thank you to all the panelists. Uh, I'll turn it over to you, Mike. Thank you. All right, thank you. Everybody can hear me okay, I hope? Yep. Looks like we lost a few people from the previous panel, which was a great panel. I just wanna thank everybody on the panel for acknowledging the work that we do in, in Red Hook an important facility for the city. So welcome to the panel on truck congestion crisis in ports, a crisis with interrelated solutions. I'm Mike Stamata, CEO of Red Hook Terminals, operator of the Red Hook Container Terminal and the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal. And please join me in welcoming my fellow panelists, Kim Gaddy from the South Ward Environmental Alliance, Leslie Vas Vasquez from South Bronx United, and Zach Miller, from the Trucking Association of New York. And Zach, I am also a suffering uh, Mets fan. I saw that in your bio. There is no other kind. As well as my son. <laughs> so I'm gonna kick off the discussion by asking everyone in the audience a question. And I need that picture up on there behind me. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask everybody the question here to raise your hand. Who loves trucks? All right, I wasn't expecting, of course, too many people to raise, raise your hand. Um, but I will say I love trucks. However, I do not like sitting behind them in traffic like the picture behind me. But as a port operator, an importer, a distributor, they are an integral part of our business. But more importantly, they are an integral part of modern civilization and society. With, with a population in New York City expected to reach over 9 million people by 2030. There is no way to sustain a growing population without trucks, but clearly we are reaching a tipping point. If we not, do not do something where, we'll, where we will, if we do not do something soon to change the way freight is reliably delivered into, out of, and around New York City, we will reach a point where we will not be able to reliably sustain and provide the food, medicine, clothes, and other goods we need, uh, but also the cost of these goods will continue to rise, making New York City even more expensive, impacting every person and every business, and ultimately deteriorating the quality of life uh, for all New Yorkers. The, the next slide, please. The, the heat map on the screen behind me um, projects areas of peak congestion in 2035, and clearly we can all see that we are in the heart of the worst of it. So whose fault is this and how do we fix it? Well, it's not the fault of the people who drive those trucks. They are as unhappy and frustrated sitting in traffic congestion as we all are while they try to do the job we need them to do. And it's not really just trucks causing the congestion. There are more cars on the road than ever, many of them Ubers, Lyfts, or other car services driving around waiting for their next fare further contributing to the increased truck traffic and congestion. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the term supply chain became part of the daily lexicon on news channels across the country as experts were called on to explain why ships were waiting weeks at anchor to unload goods needing to be distributed across the country. The surge of goods being imported into the US caused the Port of New York and New Jersey to reach record levels until that weren't expected to be seen until the end of the decade. With most Americans on lockdown, spending hours shopping online, ordering goods to be shipped directly to their homes, a supply chain crisis emerged that caused port facilities and on the East Coast and West Coast to quickly fill up and warehouses to quickly reach capacity, resulting in shortages of basic goods and long delays to receive numerous other items. Today's modern conveniences and demands for everything to be delivered ASAP, including groceries and meals, think DoorDash. Uh, my son is an expert at ordering from DoorDash. Uh, DoorDash and Uber Eats 
have created a new wave of traffic and congestion unlike anything seen before. Raise your hand if you've ever shopped online and had something delivered to your home or business. Right? I'd be shocked if there's anybody here who hasn't. Um, so how do we maintain a stable supply chain for the city of New York, the region, while addressing traffic and congestion? This is an issue that affects all of us, but it does not impact all of us equally. Just ask anyone living in Newark, the Bronx, Brooklyn, Staten Island, or any community near a major highway, bridge, or tunnel where large volumes of trucks and other vehicles sit idling in traffic for many hours of the day. For many in these communities, traffic and congestion is not just a nuisance. It, is, it can be a life threatening, it can be life threatening as the environmental impacts of thousands of tons of truck and vehicle emissions concentrated in these areas cause the rate of asthma and other health issues related to pollution to skyrocket. So how do we solve this complicated problem when the main source of the problem, trucks, is something we cannot live without? That's what we're going to talk about today. As a port operator with facilities in Newark and Brooklyn, we decided a number of years ago to begin looking at innovative technologies and other ways to reduce our environmental impact on the community around us. In 2020, Red Hook Terminals deployed the first fleet of zero emission battery electric terminal tractors at our facility in Newark. And, and I believe, Kim, you were there that day. Um, to date, we're the only terminal oper in, operator in the Port of New York and New Jersey to do so. We, are able to do, we were able to do this with a $2.5 million grant from the New Jersey DOP, DEP because this technology is so expensive. The only way for us to acquire these trucks was through the support of a grant, so our out-of-pocket cost was similar to purchasing diesel. The trucks are working great, and our labor at the terminal loves them. I do not think I could even convince them to go back into a diesel truck. No noise, no exhaust, no re reduced maintenance, and other operating costs have made our decision a good one for our business, our employees, and the community around us. So yes, electrification is one of the solutions to mitigate the source of emissions. That, that works great in the right environment where you can control the charging as needed. Red Hook Terminals is committed to electrifying all of our facilities and eliminating all diesel equipment and emissions at our facilities as technology evolves to do so. That technology is rapidly developing and we are in the process of also preparing for an EPA Clean Ports grant to further accelerate our goals. The shipping community is also embracing innovative technology to reduce the carbon footprint of ocean transportation. Over 80% of the world's goods move on the ocean, making shipping the backbone of the global supply chain. Our largest customer in Brooklyn, Seaboard Marine, has new ships under construction that will be powered by LNG and instead of dirty fuel oil and capable of connecting to shore power while alongside in port, further reducing and eliminating carbon emissions in their operations. Part of our grant application will be to electrify, electrify our terminal. Other technologies are emerging. Green hydrogen will become transformative as the cable capability to produce green hydrogen from seawater and other renewable sources becomes available. Hydrogen fuel cells and hydrogen combustion engines powering vehicles, trucks, vessels, and other equipment further eliminating carbon emissions and the safe storage and transportation of hydrogen is rapidly developing as well. Earlier today, some of you have watched the panel on Blue Highway, which I thought was great. The movement of intermodal containers, trucks, and freight by water by barge, also known as short sea shipping, this is not a novel idea. In fact, this is how much of the freight in countries around the world still moves today. And New York Harbor was once bustling with barges moving commodities across the city and region. The Erie Canal for, is another notable example of how freight moved in and out, out of our region in the past. The first navigable waterway, waterway connecting the Atlantic Ocean to the Great Lakes, once called our nation's first superhighway. Eventually, the St. Lawrence Seaway and the railroad and trucks ended up, ended the reliance on the Erie Canal as a means of moving freight, and today it primarily serves recreational watercraft. Red Hook Terminals has been at the forefront over the last decade trying to revive the Blue Highway and operates a barred service between our terminals in Newark and Brooklyn. 
that moves almost 30, 000, removes almost 30,000 truck trips annually from the Cross Harbor bridges and roadways connecting New York and New Jersey. Later this year, with the help of a U.S. DOT MARAD grant, in partnership with Hughes Marine, we'll be planning to launch a new roll-on, roll-off barge service capable of moving 24 by 48 foot trailers or any combination of smaller trucks with trailers. With companies like UPS and others now looking out over the water as a means of reducing their dependency on trucks crossing bridges and through tunnels. Um, the goal, with the goal of moving their trucks closer to their final mile destination by water. Red Hook and Hughes are making this investment in the future of the Blue Highway in hopes of bringing back this once vital means of transportation for freight in New York City and beyond. Blue Highway for freight mobility in and around the city in these areas of concern in close proximity to our bridges, tunnels, and major highways, and we applaud all of these efforts. There is another panel discussion happening simultaneously right now entitled Ports and Offshore Wind. In 2015, Red Hook Terminals and Industry City formed a joint venture called Sustainable South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, SSBMT, with the goal of obtaining a lease from the New York City EDC on the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal. On the cover of our proposal back then was a picture of an offshore wind farm. And in our proposal, the idea to develop and build the first of its kind port facility completely dedicated to the emerging offshore wind industry. Thanks to this shared vision of Governor Hochul and NYSERDA, New York City Mayor Adams and New York City EDC, and a huge commitment from Equinor, the offshore wind developer, I'm proud to announce construction of that new South Brooklyn Marine Terminal began uh, last week and our vision is becoming a reality. New York State and New York City's commitment to offshore wind development and to building the port infrastructure needed for its construction will allow New York State and city to meet its goals for offshore wind energy development, further demonstrating how ports will play a leading role in solving our truck and tra traffic congestion crisis while, while providing the clean renewable energy to help achieve our electrification goals in the future. Last week, Red Hook Terminals had the honor of hosting Governor Hochul and Mayor Adams, our container terminal in Brooklyn, for a historic announcement. For years, we and others, including the Waterfront Alliance, have been sounding the alarm concerning the lack of investment, maintenance, and repair by the Port Authority concerning the Brooklyn Marine Terminal. And the open secret, the Port Authority has done its best to close the port in Brooklyn altogether, citing it's not being needed. Their solution, just truck everything in. Of course, an agency that derives much of its income from tolls paid by these trucks <laughs> crossing over bridges and through tunnels in and out of New York City would say that. The Port Authority's name should really just be changed, I think, to the Toll Authority. Um, <laughs> under an, that, under an agreement signed in 1979, the Port Authority has had the responsibility of maintaining this infrastructure but has failed to do so. In October of last year, the Port Authority notified us they were condemning piers 9A and 9B, causing us to lose our warehouse and barge berth and two cranes, putting the future of the port further at risk. Last week, under a new agreement, the Port Authority will transfer control of the Red Hook piers over to the city of New York and EDC. Under city control, new investments have already been announced, totaling almost $100 million, including a new crane, repairs to existing piers, $15 million towards a cold storage facility, and grant applications for over 300 plus million dollars for repairs and improvements for existing piers and modernization to build the green port of the future to serve the needs of the people of New York City. While this is a huge step towards the long-term future of the port, it is also a recognition and commitment by the city and state of New York that without the Red Hook Port and the expansion of freight mobility on the water, establishing what I like to call mass transit for freight, um, we cannot solve the truck and traffic congestion crisis we are here to talk about today. When Mayor Adams was Brooklyn Borough President Adams, he committed to securing the future of the Red Hook Port. I must say, as Mayor Adams, he is living up to his commitment, uh, providing the necessary leadership and capital resources to help solve this crisis, improving the lives and health of all New Yorkers while securing our economic future building a more sustainable, environmentally friendly, and resilient supply chain. 
And I'm going to end my probably too long introduction, <laughs> um, but thank you for indulging me because I really want to get all that out. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to ask our panelists here uh, why this issue, Kim, I'm going to start with you. Why is this issue of truck traffic and congestion important to you? Okay, well, thank you for that. I'm Kim Gaddy, founder and executive director of the South Ward Environmental Alliance. We are located in the South Ward of Newark, uh, the largest ward in the city. We have 80,000 residents. We are the backyard to the third largest port. Um, I, you know, got involved in this after spending about 12 years in municipal government as a chief of staff to three different council members. I was out on maternity leave and my daughter was diagnosed with asthma uh, at the age of six months. I have three children um, who suffer from asthma. And, unfor and unfortunately, two years ago, my 32-year-old died of a premature heart attack. So I got involved because the health of my community was at stake. We was just trying to breathe. When you think about being the backyard of the third largest port with 25,000 trucks coming through that port on a daily basis, 4,500 staying on your local road, it impacts your life each and every day. And you could just go through the slides because I want to make sure we, uh, everybody else has the opportunity. And you'll see from these slides that our community is a diesel death zone. We can't escape from it. The cumulative impacts of pollution cause premature heart attacks. One in four children in the city of Newark suffer from asthma. And this is just because of the color of our skin and the zip code we reside in. And that has to change. And so oftentimes I'm so appreciative of being in these circles because we have to get uncomfortable to become comfortable. And we also know that there are solutions. We are allowing the dirtiest trucks to stay on the road when they shouldn't have to. The technology exists. We need to make sure that we establish zero emission zones within our community. Our community is involved with yearly truck counts and air monitors. We have purple air monitors. We just purchased black carbon monitors. And we actually have our residents wearing atmitudes. Um, and this is because our live experience tell us that the environmental degradation is harming us, but you have to have the data, they say, so that then we could establish the policy and the initiatives to help restore our communities. Um, and we know that it was a great thing for our community to be next to you know, a port, which is the economic engine of the region, uh, but we also have to understand that our lives matter, right? And that we have to be able to exist collectively. And so there are ways that we can change um, what that looks like in our respective neighborhoods. And so I'm just gonna you know, jump to some solutions. You could go through the slides. And you know, the electrification of freight transportation is huge. Um, I'm so happy that the Biden-Harris administration, I'm a member of the Moving Forward Network, which is a national uh, movement of, of port communities. And the Biden-Harris administration just, I think, three weeks ago, um, set the first ever national goal of zero emission freight sector, announced nearly $1.5 billion to support the transition to zero emission heavy duty vehicles. And this is a fight that we've been fighting for years. We also understand that we've been trying to work with our state. I, I chair the Environmental Justice Advisory Council for our governor and Governor Murphy, and we continually support our DEP and initiatives to make sure that zero emissions can happen in our freight transportation by 2035. Uh, but we also know that there has to be stronger rules and regulations. So the EPA phase three greenhouse gas rule, uh, the California heavy duty truck rule, which uh, I'm quite sure all you know about that, um, is really important. But then when you think about hyper-local uh, pollution and monitoring our communities, we have to also hold our local elected officials accountable. And so we look at alternative truck routes. We want to make sure that we're able to move these trucks from these neighborhoods that is closest to the port. 
right? We have Weequay Park, which is an Olmstead Park, like you have a park here in New York. Um, and the if we stand out on the corner of that park in one hour, we're counting 350 to 400 trucks in an hour. And that's crazy. And so we have to make sure that then we could create buffer zones, right? So that we know it's a weighted road, but does it have to be four lanes? Can we reduce it down to two so that it is a little bit further removed from the park and for homes? Um, and then we also must understand that we need zero emission zones so that our communities cannot suffer from the pollution. And so I say this because we know that there are solutions out there. We have to have the political will to make the difference for these communities. And so we are glad, Southward Environmental Alliance, we established a, a Ports Advisory Council, and the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey sits on that council. Uh, Beth Rooney and her staff, Tanya and some of her other staff that's in here today, um, and they come to the table to talk to us. And that's what it takes, because we're not saying that uh, we don't want to ever have any communication with any entity. But what we're saying is our lives are important. We understand what solutions need to be done. But those solutions can't be made if you don't have the community voices at the table. Environmental justice means that we have to have a seat at the table and meaningful participation. We don't need other individuals to dictate to us, to tell us what our community needs. We know. So let's come together as a collective and really begin to address the environmental degradation that individuals suffer just because of their close proximity to ports. And so for us, trucks is a problem, and we know it's not going to go away tomorrow, but it doesn't mean that it has to be our future. And so I want to you know, respect time so that my colleagues can speak, but that's just a snapshot into what we experience on a daily basis. And I'm looking forward to having some uh, real conversations because it starts in rooms like this. We're not against industry. We're not against unions. What we want is thriving, healthy, vibrant neighborhoods. That's what we want. Thank you. All right, Leslie. Yeah, um, so why is this important in the South Bronx? Can you guys hear me OK? OK. Better? OK, yeah. great. Um, so I work at South Bronx Unite, and we represent the Mott Haven and Port Morris sectors of the South Bronx. Uh, those are the last two sectors in, uh, in the South Bronx entirely, and we have absolutely no access to our waterfront because they're taken up by these polluting facilities that are causing so much injustice in our community. We have four power plants. We have mega warehouses that uh, require last mile trucks. We have all of the Bronx's waste management directed to our area entirely. And we have three major highways, and I can go on and on and on about all of the things that are cited within our community. Now, all of these polluting infrastructures require trucks and last mile freight to come in and out of our community. And in the South Bronx, we have one of the highest asthma rates in the entire country. Mm. So when you think about where is this coming from and why are our people suffering from this issue, it's definitely not a coincidence when you look at how our community is comprised. We are primarily people of color, <coughs> primarily immigrants, primarily people who are English learners, uh, low income. And so when you think about the siting and the very, very um, intentional um, decisions that policymakers have made throughout the years, you know that the, these disadvantaged communities continue to be vulnerable because of truck traffic, because of air pollution, and because of the lack of access to health, uh, to resources that provide health outcomes. And so when you know that this is an issue and you don't do anything about it, that's also intentional. We have um, infrastructure, we have resources, we have funding coming towards other parts of New York City. But when you think of the South Bronx, you don't see as much of those resources being distributed. You don't see DC chargers being prioritized in our industrial area. You don't see people giving out inhalers or asthma pumps or things like that 
to fix the issue that is, or temporarily fix the issue that is happening within our community. So why is this important for our community? It's because we are not prioritized and we never have been. But like Kim has said, this is the exact space that we need to be to include our community in every single decision that we make, whether that's blue highways, whether that's electrifying trucks and vehicles, or anything else that includes um, improving the quality of life of our community. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. So everyone hear me? Great. Mm -hmm. So um, Leslie and Kim really nailed it. The thing is, you know, for so long, the, the trucking industry was sort of the industry of no, and the, you know, an industry that took its economic responsibility very seriously, but not its community obligations very seriously. Thankfully, that is changing. Uh, mm -hmm. We are the community of yes, we are the community of let's look at various options, some of which I'm about to mention, and I think even more, if not equally importantly, uh, uh, an industry that respects its community, the communities that we serve, the communities that we work in, um, being part of conversations with panels like this is certainly a part of it. Um, it for, for too long there has been that disconnect, and that disconnect shows up, as Kim even mentioned, where there are amazing economic opportunities that um, freight hubs generate, but those opportunities went to people who lived far away from those communities. So yes. people had to drive in for that economic opportunity. We can't have that anymore. We shouldn't have had it then. We certainly can't have it now. As we move into a zero emission and near zero emission, and we use near zero because um, you know, outside of tailpipe emissions, there are still, um, you know, life cycle of a, of a vehicle does have some emissions, but as we move towards that economy, making sure that the op economic opportunities go to the communities that those hubs are generated in. Um, we are building all this new, which is really exciting. It's an exciting time to be a part of this industry. Um, at, we like to say there are lots of balls up in the air right now. And the order in which they fall is going to determine the success of the zero emission transition. Um, and the community engagement is a vital component of that. Some statistics I would like to say, and, and you totally nailed it about getting the dirty trucks off the road. There was a study that came out recently that said, if we eliminated every single pre-2011 mm -hmm. diesel truck from the road, yep. we would improve emissions in the United States by something like 83%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, our, you can see I'm passionate about it. <laughs> our primary responsibility right now, <laughs> getting those vehicles off the road, even if they're replaced with new diesel, the, the, the air coming from those diesels is nowhere near as pollutant as it was, yes. nowhere near as toxic, nowhere near as dangerous. This is how we transition. We, we move in a way that gets more and more cleaner vehicles on the road faster. Um, I, I, you know, I could go on and on. I, I just do want to quickly mention, um, you know, we talk about vehicle miles traveled, we talk about getting trucks off the road. The truth is we need to add significant efficiencies in our supply chain. New York mm -hmm. City is heavily reliant on trucks. I probably could say the word over-reliant, but I might get in trouble with uh, my bosses. But, <laughs> but here's the thing. 90% of freight in New York City is delivered via, via truck. The national average is about 73%. It, it was about 70, it spiked up a little bit during COVID, but it, it really taps out at 73%. So all other negative externalities aside, which we are discussing today, which are crucial to discuss, it's actually a burden on industry to have to be responsible for all that. So when we look at things like the waterways, like um, micro distribution centers, cargo hubs, electric vehicles, overnight deliveries, these are vital to create a much more efficient supply chain so that our number one priority is moving freight in a safe, sustainable, and efficient manner. And these are the ways in which we'll be able to do it moving forward. All right, so I think we've heard certainly how personal this issue is to everybody here on the panel, right? I mean, it has long-lasting impacts on people's lives from a health standpoint. It's not just about wasting time sitting in traffic, right? So we hear about how this affects everybody. And we've heard a little bit about solutions, right? I'm going to ask Zach, is it, is it fair to say that the trucking community is ready and willing to, to transform itself into zero emission technology, whatever that may be, that makes sense, assuming 
there's a way to pay for it because that's always going to be a challenge. Where is the trucking community at today in terms of electrification and how do you see that progressing? Well, I think, I think you really nailed it in the first part of that is there, there needs to be a menu of options. Um, battery electric is not going to work for every sector and that's okay because there are going to be technologies and options that will. But where battery electric does work, we need to make those investments. We're starting to see a lot of that in New York in the last mile. Um, we'll continue to see more of that in the last mile as the charging infrastructure um, comes online. Um, you mentioned hydrogen for over the road. Hydrogen looks like a really, really terrific option that we're really excited about. Um, you know, things like man, you know, person power like bicycles or, or hand carts or things like that. Um, as long as there are options, and, and GH, uh, G3 kind of addressed that, where it's not, uh, some of the regulations are very heavily on battery electric. GH3 is a little bit more, there's, there's a menu, there's a way to get to zero emission. Um, being uh, technology agnostic, that's the way the industry views it, mm -hmm. that's the way it's gonna have to be. Um, but, you know, provided that there are those options available, um, you know, the, the industry is, we're making those strides. So, and you also, I think you nailed it when you said it's about changing the supply chain, because mm -hmm. even if every single truck and car was to be electrified tomorrow, we still have the issue of traffic and congestion that has real severe economic impacts. So I think right now we're getting close to the end of this panel. We're going to open it up to some questions, if anybody has questions in the audience for, for our panel. Anybody want to go first? Or you want to touch on truck routing to issues? So one of the things that we're encouraged by, not just in the uh, truck route redesign, but also some, and I know I'm going to say city of yes, and it's controversial in, in places, but there are some parts of it that make a lot of sense, particularly as it relates to freight. Um, a proposal to have more neighborhood style loading, uh, you know, in, in vacant retail outlets. This would um, open up some micro hubs. The, the point is, that through some of the zoning changes and through the truck route redesign, um, the plan is to sort of democratize it, right? Instead of having one or two communities highly overburdened by warehousing and distribution, to spread the distribution a little bit more evenly across the city. Now, there are always going to be some major, major generators, and that's something we have to be cognizant of and, and work with DOT to make sure that, um, you know, exactly like Kim said, that the, the truck route is there and it goes there, uh, but in a way that doesn't overburden that community. Our anticipation is over the next, you know, 20, 30 years, this becomes a much more uh, decentralized, democratized process. I'd like to add on to that uh, answer and also say that as we do this transition to rerouting trucks and doing congestion pricing and rerouting that traffic from a specific area to another, it's also important to prioritize the implementation of new infrastructure so that we can transition in the next couple of years equitably. Um, no, we are not ready to transition to electric fleets completely because we don't have the charging infrastructure and the grid isn't ready to equip that much power um, for all of the neighborhoods. So it's kind of like a chicken and the mm -hmm. egg issue where it's like, okay, you have to do all of these things at once. You don't have any of them, so you can't electrify. But when are we going to get to that point when we do electrify and when we do rezone and we reroute these trucks, how are we going to make sure that the way that we are doing it now also has a proper infrastructure in place to eventually transition. How do we make sure that we have charging hubs within these truck routes and making sure that it's also not impacting the community by adding on more, even more traffic than what is already there? Yeah. Next question. Thank you. In, in the um, <clears throat> announcement last week, the press release, there is a a lot of um, play given to um, 
non-truck, last mile freight delivery, uh, cargo bikes, equats, how much of that do you think can actually be part of the solution for the immediate neighborhoods around some of these uh, hubs? I mean, our business is unloading and loading ships, so we're used to handling, you know, full container loads of freight. I think micro distribution and moving freight in and around the city by water and then having last mile delivery by some other form of transportation, whether it's a cargo bike or something else, can certainly be part of a system. I think you need a system, right? You need a way of getting these goods as close to their final destination as possible because part of the problem we have today is there's so many truck, truck moves going around the city, through the city, out of state truck moves coming through the city to get out of state again. Uh, it's a broken system that's quite chaotic. So I would just say that any new facilities to be built can certainly in include all these multimodal types of, of freight m uh, movement. I mean, there's companies doing it today. I mean, uh, Amazon and UPS are working with other smaller companies that are moving freight on cargo bikes, for example. They're, a cargo bike can hold 500 pounds of freight and move a lot quicker and easier around uh, the city than a truck can. So it really just depends on how the private sector views it. And I just wanted to add that when you're thinking about the cumulative impacts of pollution that the most marginalized communities, black and brown communities, suffer from, when you're thinking about any kind of warehouse, you know, building warehouses and bringing them into those communities, we need to begin to think about eco-districts. And so you could you can provide these micro uh, green companies, right, that are a part or can assist the trucking industry, but you don't have to bring the dirtiest trucks or industries back into these communities. And so that's a way of trying to help to restore and heal our community by keeping away the dirtiest industries, the dirtiest trucks. If you know you have to come into the South Ward or the Ironbound of Newark and it's already impacted by cumulative impacts of pollution and thousands of trucks daily, then the cleanest trucks should only have a pass to come into these communities and neighborhoods so that you are reducing and mitigating the pollution that we can't escape from because of the highways, the railways, the ships, right? There is so much more that adds to the distribution of freight and the logistical chain that we are not even talking about. And so at least what we can do is look at these communities and say that burden is already too much. Let's make sure that the cleanest fleets, you know, the, the newer companies, if they want to bring in warehouses, because that is a problem in our communities as well, but if you're going to bring them in, make sure that they're not going to add to flooding into our community. Uh, those buildings are energy efficient, they have solar, they have green infrastructure, you know, they have all the things that, that we can now utilize to help improve our health as opposed to adding uh, to the um, health mm. impacts. We need standards, basically, I think. For right? sure. We need a standardized method of trucking into the city, around the city, that allows and sort of mandates there's some certain conformity to minimum restrictions in terms of what can be done. The Port Authority today doesn't allow certain trucks to enter the port if they don't meet a certain age requirement. Maybe that's something that should be done in, in communities for sure that are most at risk, but maybe in general that's, we need to start eliminating some of these things. And that's another good question for Zach and, and the trucking industry. I think certainly that's certain being done to some degree today. Yeah, and that actually ties in really well to, you know, when I said there's a menu of options and, you know, New York City has a really great um, incentive program to get fleets to um, mm -hmm. scrap their old right. vehicles and purchase new vehicles and there's a menu of options so the most money you'll get back is for battery electric but there's there are tier systems and something like that particularly among like the large freight generators is is a type of tool that could incentive incentivize these fleets to say well yeah I gotta I gotta talk to DOT about this clean trucks program I got to um, make some changes and we saw it successfully by the way with the uh, Hunts Point, um, it's it's called New York City Clean Trucks Program. It started as a Hunts Point program, um, and that's what got so many uh, California certified um, clean idle vehicles on the road, uh, is because of that program and because DOT said, hey, you know, if you're operating in Hunts Point, 
these are the vehicles we need you to get, but we're going to help you get them. It, it worked incredibly well, so much so that it blew up into the New York City Clean Trucks program. Um, so we have a template for its success. Zach, All right. the only thing I want to add to that is that on the New Jersey side, we have a lot of independent truck drivers. That's a great and yes. So, I, right? No, so yeah. it doesn't address those individuals who are independent owners and operators. So if the fleet which are the larger fleets, they have the money anyway, and all the money is going to them to replace the trucks. Those independent truck drivers who own those trucks, they can't afford to pay the amount of money for the newer trucks. And so we hit a glitch. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you want to elaborate no, on that's that. A, that's a terrific point, and that's, a, that's um, one of our sort of big frustrations is that the independent drivers really are that low-hanging fruit. Um, it's like you say, you know, they, they are on the road six days a week. If they're not on the road, they are not making money. They are not providing for their families. Uh, being an independent driver is a very hard life, but a lot of people find it to be a very rewarding life. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there is that sort of disconnect between getting these incentive programs to them, um, having them utilize it. And, um, you know, I, I wish I had an answer for it right now. Independent drivers are uh, a particular group of people for sure, but I think as more and more, this is something that is a, another passion of mine, um, there's no secondary market for electric mm. trucks right now. Right. So many small, particularly the owner operators, they mm. buy their trucks used. They buy them on a yeah. secondary market. Without a secondary market, it is almost impossible for them to get those vehicles. I'm really encouraged at more cities, you know, New York City, of course, is at the forefront, more cities taking the lead in bulk purchase of electric vehicles. When they cycle those vehicles out, they can really help establish that mm -hmm. secondary market to hit the owner operators. Um, but unfortunately, we're not there yet, and it is uh, a real big sticking point um, for, the, for the industry right now. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Hi, uh, thanks for bringing up that topic about um, funding and incentives that, where there's sort of a gap between those opportunities and independent drivers. Um, my question is really around um, how does congestion pricing intersect with um, this, well, this industry in general, but the kind of um, the intention to transform to zero emissions and the funding that is required to make something like that happen. And just a point that I think from the perspective of most people who are not like super plugged into um, or related to the trucking industry, um, trucks generally have a big problem with communication, or I should say the trucking industry has a problem with communication and kind of getting uh, people's backing and support societally. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a bit about congestion pricing and how that affects the push for zero emissions and um, that communication support from the people? So we are aware we have an image problem, I would say. Um, you know, we're, we're working really hard on that, um, but we're aware it exists. Y you know, with the congestion pricing, um, one of our frustrations with it is that there was no discount rate for zero emission vehicles, nor is there really funds allocated um, to purchase them. I know there's some, the state moved some money into the clean trucks program, mm -hmm. um, but really the revenue f collected from congestion pricing is going to the MTA. Um, you know, there are peak and off-peak discounts, but there's no clean vehicle discount. And that's something that um, I know when London instituted theirs, they had it. Um, I think they, they phased it out recently because it was successful and most of those vehicles are, are now, you know, um, much cleaner. But, you know, that was something that we asked for as these conversations happened and, um, you know, it's not something that the MTA gave. And, you know, I, I do believe it was a real wasted opportunity. I'd also like to say that, yes, there is a, a communications issue in the trucking industry, but that also impacts the grassroots organizations that are trying to contact the trucking industry and the organizations or companies that are using that. Um, and so we would love to let independent 
fleet owners know about these incentives. We would love to support and give out resources and one pagers, but they're impossible to contact. They're impossible to get access to. And so there is a huge gap between that advocacy work and that resource distribution as well. Um, now, when it comes to congestion pricing, that is a very special case issue in the Mott Haven and Port Morris sector of the South Bronx. Uh, the MTA proposed seven different scenarios of rerouting the trucks and going to different parts so that that lower Manhattan area can get alleviated with congestion and with traffic. Now, though that does improve air quality in lower Manhattan, that will worsen air quality in Mott Haven and Port Morris in the South Bronx. Mm. All seven scenarios that the MTA provided all lead to more traffic and congestion in the RFK Bridge and in the Bruckner Expressway and the Major Deegan, which are all right on the Mott Haven and Port Morris neighborhoods. So while we think about congestion pricing, and although, yes, a lot of people are for it, we also don't think about the communities that are being negatively impacted by this rerouting, by this implementation of new routes and policies and whatnot. Um, and so our, our community continues to be disadvantaged, continues to get more health burdens. And uh, like I said, there is no current temporary fix. You can't tell the world that, um, you can't tell people that the world is on fire without giving them a fire extinguisher. Mm -hmm. So when you provide even more traffic and cause even more pollution, which cause more cumulative health impacts, what are you doing to address that issue in the moment? All right, so <clears throat> I just want to thank everybody up here on the panel. This has been a, a great discussion. You know, I believe this room should have been full for this one as well because it really impacts people's lives uh, tremendously. So give a round of applause to our panelists. <laughs> and I'm sure there'll be more to come on this topic as we, you know, the top, our panel was talking about interrelated, interrelated solutions. So. Uh, more to come on all the things that are being discussed here today at other panel discussions because they all boil down to how do we solve this problem in the end. So thank you. Thanks, Dan. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.